The last piece of chorus there. That's better? Yeah. There you go. Now, we'll start again. I'm blaming Paul for emotionally challenging me before I start speaking. That last piece of chorus there whelms me with the preparation that I've been doing and the things that I've been experiencing and meeting and talking to people around this country. And so, I'm not an emotional person, most of you know that. <laughs> so if I start crying, cry with me. <laughs> Today we're in Luke chapter 18. It's the parable of the persistent widow. It's only verses 1 through 8, and it's part of our Kingdom of Heaven is Lake series. And I took advantage of the fact that we were going to be out here to not do any slides. You would have known that if I'd done a slide, but there's none there. I'm loving the fact that we're in this place with the open air. I think we should do this every Sunday. That we have the picnic. Every Sunday that we have the picnic. So although the assigned text is chapter 18, 1 through 8, the first verse starts out with the word, then. Then Jesus told them a parable to show them they should always pray and not to lose heart. The word then suggests we should look back to grab some understanding of what happened prior to this. It's one of those indicators that says you'll get some comprehension if you have been following along and paying attention to what came before. Why is Jesus teaching a lesson about not losing heart? Well, we'll look at it and find out. I'm going to open a quick word of prayer, and then we'll get into Scripture. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the opportunity to come here in this open air to speak your word. Lord, we thank you for all of those who, who made this possible. Lord, we thank you for your, your words and the scripture that we're looking at in your, what you revealed to me and the calm that you bring. Bless this time. May our ears be open and our minds be capable. Amen. Luke chapter 17, starting in verse 20. Now at one point, the Pharisees asked Jesus when the kingdom of God was coming. So he answered, the kingdom of God is not coming with signs to be observed, nor will they say, look, here it is, or there, for indeed the kingdom of God is in your midst. And then he said to his disciples, the days are coming when you will desire to see one of the days of the Son of Man, and you will not see it. Then people will say to you, look, there he is, or look, here he is. Do not go out or chase after them, for just like the lightning flashes and lights up the sky from one side to another, so will the Son of Man be in his day. But first, he must suffer many things and be rejected by this generation. Just as it was in the days of Noah, so too it will be in the days of the Son of Man. People were eating, they were drinking, they were marrying, they were being given in marriage right up to the day Noah entered the ark. Then the flood came and destroyed them all. Likewise, just as it was in the days of Lot, people were eating, drinking, buying, selling, planting, building. But on the day Lot went out from Sodom, fire and sulfur rained down from heaven and destroyed them all. It will be the same on the day of the Son of Man is revealed. On that day, anyone who is on the roof with his goods in the house must not come down to take them away. And likewise, the person in the field must not turn back. Remember Lot's wife. Whoever tries to keep his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life will preserve it. I tell you, in that night there will be two people in one bed. One will be taken and the other left. There will be two women grinding grain together. One will be taken, and the other left. Then the disciples said to him, Where, Lord? He replied to them, Where the dead body is, there the vultures will gather. And now for my assigned portion of Scripture. Then Jesus told them a parable to show them they should always pray and not lose heart. He said in a certain city there was a judge who neither feared God nor respected people. There was also a widow in that city who kept coming to him and saying, Give me justice against my adversary. For a while he refused, but later on he said to himself, Though I neither fear God nor have regard for people, yet because this widow keeps on bothering me, I will give her justice. 
for in the end she will wear me out by her unending pleas. And the Lord said, listen to what the unrighteous judge says. Won't God give justice to this chosen ones who cry out to him day and night? Will he, de will he delay long to help them? I tell you, he will give them justice speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? These verses are concerned with the coming of the kingdom and the coming of the Son of Man, referring to Jesus' return, but also dealing with prayer. And we're going to focus primarily on the topic of prayer this morning. Let me ask you a question. When do you stop praying? When do you stop praying? That is, after you start praying for something, when do you decide, you know what? I'm, going to, I'm not going to pray for that anymore. When do you stop praying? We have been taught that we are to pray continually. We understand that prayer ought to be a lifestyle for the believer. Some have said that prayer for the believer should be as natural a reflex as breathing, and that's very true. John Barry often refers to us in the mornings and Sunday meetings and how he goes through his days just praying to the Lord continually. He's not the only one. It's great for it to be second nature to whisper our prayer to God at any time during our day. In all circumstances, for all people. We're often to complete, we are often compelled to pray during trials, troubles, times of crisis. We do our best to pray when life is good especially when life is good, so that we don't become independent and begin to think that we're doing everything on our own. So we pray, Lord, help me to be, not to be prideful. Help me to remember I'm dependent upon you. We pray when there's troubles and trials in life. We pray when we're in dire need. We pray when we prosper. Through prayer, we express our faith and our dependency upon God. We express what we believe about his character. He's loving. He hears and he answers prayers. He's our Heavenly Father. Prayer is absolutely essential to the Christian life. If you're a believer, you should endeavor to have a vibrant prayer life. We all know the story of Daniel and the lion's den, and God shook the mouths of the lions. It wasn't the moment or one day of prayer that made that possible. It was years of prayer and communion with God leading up to that day that led to a life of faith. Through that faith, a heart knowledge of God's character and a care for him, that faith to pray to him when he faced the crisis. So let me ask you again, when do you stop praying? More specifically, when you begin to pray for something or someone and the answer doesn't seem to come or is long in coming, when do you decide, okay, enough's enough? I'm done praying for that. Is it an arbitrary decision? If you haven't heard from God, I guess you know, He hasn't slid the door. If you haven't heard anything, is it a random decision? What determines that? We all have things that we've begun to pray for, and we haven't received an answer to the things we pray for. And we pray, and we pray, and we pray, and we haven't received an answer yet. At some point along the way, we have all decided to stop. At what point do we make that decision? What prompts us to stop praying? Is it despair, frustration, resignation, or even acceptance? It depends for each person, and sometimes each circumstance, but the Lord has an encouragement for us in this passage. Look at verse 1 of Luke 18. It says, And he, Jesus, told them a parable to the effect that they ought always to pray and not lose heart. <clears throat> they had always to pray and not lose heart. Primarily what this passage is dealing with is prayer in anticipation of Christ's return. In chapter 17, we see some disturbing and terrible things. And the Lord is telling them not to give up when these things come. We see that in chapter 8, verses, in verse 8, when he refers back again to the Son of Man that he spoke of in chapter 17. He's speaking about praying for justice, which will be answered when Christ comes again. That's the specific application. However, 
there's principles here that apply to all prayer, and that's what we're going to explore today. It's fantastic for a reader of scripture to come across a passage like this that tells you in verse 1 the interpretation of the parable. The reason for the parable, the application of the parable. As many have pointed out before, there's no mystery here. He tells them the point. Pray always that you do not lose heart. The point is to always pray. There's the application. We know exactly what Jesus is teaching. The story illustrates the point. To pray persistently. To pray without fail. And so, since we have determined that our work is complete, we can begin the picnic now. <laughs> Just kidding. Actually, there's a lot more to discover. These eight verses have really taught me a lot, a lot while I've been studying them. Things that I've been fortunate enough to share in some of the most unexpected places with some unexpected people. And hopefully, they'll teach you as well. What we have as the subject of our parable is a widow. Luke, of all the Gospels, seems to focus on widows. Luke loves to plead the case and to take up the cause of the less fortunate. Luke does this through his Gospel, and here he does it again with the widow. In this ancient society, a woman was entirely dependent upon her husband as protector and provider. Although they were revered and respected, women were dependent upon their husbands. Sustenance, protection, safety, security, provisions. We can safely speculate that this widow most likely had no grown male children that could take care of her, and she apparently had no male relatives who would step in and take up the role of her now deceased husband. She had no one to take up her cause. It's a very sad case that we see here with this widow. This left her dependent upon the charity of others. She had to really throw herself upon the charity of society. Charity which oftentimes was not forthcoming. Not only did this woman have the misfortune of losing her husband, which was her sole source of support and protection, but she became vulnerable. She became vulnerable to a society which was taught to care for widows, but oftentimes would defraud and violate the widows. She became vulnerable to a society which had people that were willing to extort and deceive her and otherwise harm her. In fact, a sad state of affairs is that during Christ's day, the Pharisees and the scribes themselves were guilty of this. Jesus talks of devouring widows' houses. In the King James, it says, robbing widows' houses. They would convince the widow, if she had some money put away, that she really needed to give that money to the synagogue. She would contribute that. If she would contribute that, God would bless her. Does that sound familiar to anything you can think of today? This woman was completely at the mercy of society. A society which often sought, sought not to help and encourage, but to rob, extort, and deceive. Scripturally, the language of widowhood is often used to describe the defenseless, people who are victims. In this parable, the widow represents us. The widow those of us who are helpless and hopeless without God, those who are absolutely dependent upon Him, we are the ones the widow represents. We can presume in the widow's case, someone in her life has indeed harmed her. Somebody in some way has defrauded her, robbing her of what little she had. We know that because the parable says she was going to a judge saying, avenge me of my adversary now. She is not asking for vengeance, for vengeance sake. She's not asking for revenge. She just needs justice to be done. She was only seeking the protection that Jewish law provided for her. Let's look at some of that law. In the Old Testament, in Exodus chapter 22, verses 22 to 24, it says, You shall not mistreat any widow or fatherless child. If you do mistreat them, and they cry out to me, I will surely hear their cry. And my wrath will wax hot, and I will kill you with the sword, and your wives shall be widows. The God of heaven is a God that stands up for the defenseless. The God of heaven is a God who stands up for those who have nobody else to plead their case. That's the God that we serve, and he said, If you mistreat any widow or fatherless child, he will hear their cry, he will take up their cause. That's his character. He has interwoven protections for widows and the fatherless into the law. We see that in Deuteronomy chapter 27, verse 19. Cursed be anyone who perverts the justice due to the sojourner 
the fatherless, and the widow. And all the people said, Amen. This is the law of God, rooted in his character. He stands up for the defenseless. Psalm 68.5, he is the father of the fathers, the protector of the widows. And we know in the New Testament, this applies today as well. In James chapter 1, verse 27, it says, Religion that is pure and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself sustained, unstained from the world. So this woman takes her case, understanding that there is legal precedence for protection for widows. She takes her case to the judge, and she knows judges are to judge justly. In 2 Chronicles 19.5, this is Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah. It says he appointed judges in the land, in all the fortified cities of Judah, city by city, and said to the judges, Consider what you do, for you judge not for man, but for the Lord. He is with you, giving judgment now. Then let the fear of the Lord be upon you. Be careful what you do, for there is no injustice with the Lord our God, or partiality, or taking bribes. He's giving instructions to these judges, giving them fair warning that they are judging on behalf of God. So be impartial and be just. Certainly, there will be no taking of bribes. There ought to be the fear of the Lord as you judge. This is what the woman is hoping to find. When she comes to this judge, a judge who fears God, a judge who is going to judge justly, knowing that he stands in the place of the Lord, executing and judging according to the law. So she takes her case to the judge, throws herself upon the judge's mercy, hoping that he will rule in his, her favor, according to the law, giving her justice. Sadly, though, the woman's disappointments are not over. She comes to the judge and pleads her case. She's destitute. She's defenseless. And look at the sorry excuse for a judge. Look at verse 2. In a certain city, there is a judge who neither feared God nor respected man. That's her only hope for judge, justice according to the law. She gets this judge who has no fear of God and no fear of man. He had no conscience towards God and God's law, no bearing upon his character or the way in which he carried out the duties as a judge. No effect at all. Any hope that this widow had for legal protection afforded her under the law would come to her aid was dashed and she began to understand the character of the judge that she stood before. This is the judge that presided over his, her city. She had nowhere else to go. No ability on her part to appeal to the law because he didn't care. It says that he had no respect and no fear of God. You might think, well, he didn't fear God, but this is just common morality. Can she appeal to his common decency as a person? Can we just even guilt him into helping her? Maybe appealing to his sense of honor. Certainly this man who has this position and power is not going to just turn away a widow. I mean, what about his reputation? The parable says, not only did he have no fear of God, but he had no respect of man. No respect for man's means. He didn't care what people thought about him. He doesn't fear God. He'll not be held to the standards of God's law, nor will he feel any obligation no societal obligation to rule or care for this widow, and he won't even respond to her out of natural pity or compassion or social expectation. Job 22.9 talks about the shame of disregarding a widow, the shame of turning away a widow instead of pleading for cause. Elphaz, when he came to Job, trying to explain to Job why he was experiencing so much turmoil in his life, says, You have sent widows away empty. You have sent widows away empty, and the arms of the fathers were crushed. He's accusing him. He's shaming Job based on the law and how widows were to be cared for. This is directly from Deuteronomy 27 that I mentioned earlier. Job, obviously this is what you've done. Otherwise, you would not be suffering here, Eliphaz says. Eliphaz is saying this because it was a matter of shame to do such a thing. This man, this judge, the Bible says, did not fear God. But he also did not respect man. There's only one thing that motivated this judge. It wasn't care of the law. It wasn't the law of God. It wasn't social concerns or shame. The only thing that motivated him was the absolute unmitigated self-interest. 
self-interest. That's it. The case comes before him, and he thinks to himself, how can I benefit from this? Do you recall when Jehoshaphat was telling the judges how they ought to behave? The very last thing he tells them is take no bribes. Why would he say that? Because that's what judges did. They commonly took bribes. Somebody stands before them, they have a case, and the judge knows they have money. They're going to rule in their favor. Or they resist for a while, and they see what they're offered to rule in their favor. What can he get out of this person? That's what this judge was motivated by, self-interest and self-interest alone. This woman had nothing to give. This woman had nothing to offer whatsoever. There's no way that he could benefit from her at all. So because he's motivated only by self-interest, he disregards her. He's unjust, he's unrighteous. In fact, he lacks every quality that God required in a judge. He is a wicked judge. So far as the case of the widow is concerned, it did absolutely nothing for him, which by the way, is in direct violation of the law of God. So here we have a helpless widow appealing to the last hope that society offered her for justice, and she's rejected. She's turned away. She's hopeless when she came. She's even more hopeless when she left. The judge is absolutely unmoved by her plight, absolutely unmoved by her disappointment, absolutely unmoved by any consequences that she could incur as a result of the fact that he has not given her justice. So what is there to do in this situation? The widow has no influence, no status, no money, no ability to bribe the judge, nobody else to plead her cause, nobody to step in between her and the judge as a mediator. She has nothing except one thing, persistence. She has persistence. Verse 3 says, and there was a widow in that city who kept coming to him, who kept coming to him. Now think about this. She is throwing all honor out the window. She's throwing all pride out the window. She says, I've got nothing. I have no other way to receive justice. There's no other alternative. There's nobody I can go to. I've gone to the highest court in my city. There is no other option. So she just comes again and asks again. And the next day she comes again, and then she comes again, and then she comes again. She comes day after day after day after day, pleading with this judge. It's an act of absolute desperation. In verse 4, we see the judge's response. For a while he refused. He refused for a while. Maybe he figured that after some time, she was going to wear herself out. At some point, she's going to realize, I'm not going to answer. And she's just going to give up. And she's going to go home. And I don't have to deal with her anymore. But it says afterwards, he said to himself, though I neither fear God nor respect man, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will give her justice so that she will not beat me down by her continual coming. Remember, the judge is only driven by one thing, self-interest. And the woman asked and asked and asked and asked, persistence to the point of annoyance. It became in his best interest to rule in her favor, because though he doesn't care anything about her, he wants peace and quiet from her, continually coming and asking for justice. This judge is eventually so bothered, he decided it's in his best interest to act on her behalf, simply as a means of ridding himself of her. I said this was all about prayer, and now it's all coming into focus, right? Are you with me on this? After reading this, we get it. We understand now how we ought to pray. When we have a request, we just come to God and ask over and over and over again, day after day after day. And eventually, he's going to be sick from hearing us. He's going to answer our prayer. Right? Is that what it's teaching? No. This, this, this most certainly is not what this is teaching. This is what we call a comparison by contrast. From the lesser to the greater. This is Jesus saying, if this uncaring, unrighteous man will do that, how much more will a caring and righteous God answer us? It's a comparison by contrast that God is not at all like the judge. He is the opposite of this judge. Jesus is using, again, a rhetorical method that is used before, and we've seen it before, even in this series on the parables. I, I think it was Matt Gorman, and if I'm wrong, I apologize to who it was. I may have heard the story because he lives next door to me. 
The impromptu friend in Luke 11, 5. The man who had a friend come to visit him at midnight, and he had to go to his neighbor's house to ask for bread, as he had no bread. It was a matter of honor or shame to have someone show up for hospitality to come to your house. So the man who showed up with his friend goes knocking at his friend's house because he has no bread. His friend doesn't want to wake up because his kids are asleep. You guys remember this story from a little while ago? It's midnight. He knocks on the door. The neighbor's door, and the neighbor is saying, I and my kids are asleep. Go away. But the man finally gets up. He opens the door. He gives this man what he needs. The whole point of the story is that the man will get up and give his friend what he needs. He's not going to do it because he's his friend. He's doing it because his motivation is for his friend to go away. I mean, that's, again, it's a comparison by contrast. The motivation for getting up and giving him what he needed is for him to go away. If he will do that, then how much the more will God answer you? In that parable we see, we see the ask, the seek, and the knock, and it shall be opened. That's where we find receiving Christ. Once we've knocked and have been received, that leads to the opportunity for continual discussion with our Father through prayer. In verse 6, the Lord says, Hear what the unrighteous judge says, And will not God give justice to his elect who cry to him day and night? Will he delay long over them? If the unrighteous judge will do that, then how much the more will God do for his elect? We see another comparison by contrast in Luke 11, 11. What father among you, if his son asks for a fish, will instead of a fish, give him a serpent? If he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? scorpion. If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? That's the point of this parable as well. That's the point of this unrighteous judge. Don't ever try to compare the unrighteous judge to God the Father. You contrast the unrighteous judge with God and you realize how loving and caring God actually is. If the judge who is unrighteous has no sense of justice, if he will act on behalf of this widow, then how much more would God, who is absolutely righteous and eternally just, act on behalf of those who depend upon him? God is not bothered by our prayer. He wants to hear from us. Psalm 135, 14 says, For the Lord will vindicate his people and have compassion on his servants, the complete opposite of the unrighteous judge. If this judge will act on her behalf simply out of exasperation and annoyance, how much the more will God act on our behalf, on behalf of those whom he says he delights in hearing? Proverbs 15, 8 says, The prayer of the upright is his delight. And Psalm 147, 11 says, But the Lord takes pleasure in those who fear him and those who hope in his steadfast love. God delights in our requests. And when we come to him in prayer, knowing that we are exercising our faith. <laughs> prayer is faith in action. And when you come to God in prayer, you're saying, I need you. I depend upon you. Lord, you are the one who can provide for me over and above everything else. I am absolutely dependent upon you. I desire what you desire for me, and I am asking for you for it, because I believe by faith. Matthew 6.31 Therefore do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. Prayer is like a matter of a child coming to a father. Prayer is a matter of a child fully dependent upon his loving father, coming and asking. And the Bible says God, our heavenly Father, knows what we have need of before we even ask God is our absolute loving Father. How much the more will he hear and answer us? How much the more will God act with his continual compassion for his people when they suffer? Is God sympathetic when you suffer? Absolutely he is. Compassion is suffering along with you, somebody else. God is absolutely and eternally compassionate. Hebrews 4.15 says, For we do not have a high priest that is Christ who is unable to sympathize with our weakness, but one who is in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin in Christ, sympathizes with our weaknesses. He becomes flesh, and so that he could identify with flesh, he became weak, so that he can identify with the weak. And even now exalted as our high priest, 
he, still having become man, sympathizes with our weakness. This should have a real impact on how we pray. It's a very, that's the very context of Hebrews 4.15. Jesus sympathizes with our weakness. When you're suffering, he understands suffering. When you're going through trials, he has compassion. He comes alongside and he suffers with you. When you're hurt, he's hurt. Because of his love and compassion for us, so then we should, so that we should that do. Excuse me for that. We should do that in verse 16, Hebrews 4. Let us then, with confidence, draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in a time of need. Our struggles and our trials and our difficulties in life, we are not alone. We may feel alone here on earth, but when you realize that you have a God and a high priest, a high priest who mediates for you, who's your advocate, who's suffering along with you, he sympathizes with your weakness. That's a great encouragement because we are weak. So this, so if this judge who has no sympathy for the suffering of the widow will act on her behalf, how much, how much the more will a God who sympathizes with our suffering answer us? If this judge who only operates out of self-interest will move on behalf of this woman, this judge, who only and always operated on self-interest, if he will act on behalf of this woman, how much the more will God of heaven hear and answer your prayers? He is the one who in absolute selflessness sent Jesus Christ to die for us. If he has already made the greatest sacrifice that could ever be made, if he has already expressed the greatest act of selflessness that could ever be expressed, if he has already done that, then what in the world will he withhold from us when we pray. Then Jesus told them a parable to show them that they should always pray and not to lose heart. Going back to the very beginning in chapter 17, when Jesus was teaching the apostles what was to come, he warned them about the odd and the bad things that will occur before he comes. He knows that we will get discouraged. Some, like Lot's wife, will even reject the truth. But Jesus offers us comfort, and he's saying, Talk to me. I will keep you from losing heart. I asked, when do you stop praying? And the answer I put before you is that we should endeavor to say never. Oh, that you and I may be as persistent as this widow. That we should not lose heart. That when Christ comes again, he will find faith in you and in me. I'm going to read Psalm 40. In my preparations and my travel, I'm listening to this song by you two, all 40, brought the actual scripture to my mind. And as I read it before I prepared, it was a sign of an example of one other person praying to God continually in what we're looking for. If, as I'm reading it, if you want to read along with me, you're welcome to. Psalm 40. I waited patiently for the Lord. He turned to me and heard my cry. He lifted me out of the slimy pit out of the mud and mire. He set my feet on a rock, and he gave me a firm place to stand. He put a new song in my mouth, a hymn of praise to our God. Many will see and fear the Lord and put their trust in him. Blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord who does not look to the proud, to those who turn aside to false gods. Many, Lord my God, are the wonders you have done, the things you planned for us. None can compare with you, where I am to speak and tell of your deeds, they would be too many to declare. Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but my ears you have opened. For in offerings and sin offerings you did not require. Then I said, Here I am, I have come. It is written about me in the scroll. I desire to do your will, my God. Your law is within my heart. I proclaim your saving acts in the great assembly. I do not seal my lips, Lord, as you know. I do not hide your righteousness in my heart. I speak of your faithfulness and your saving hope. I do not conceal your love and your faithfulness from the great assembly. Do not withhold your mercy from me, Lord. May your love and faithfulness always protect me. For troubles without number surround me. My sins have overtaken me, and I cannot see. They are more than the hairs of my head, and my heart fails within me. Be pleased to save me, Lord. Come quickly, Lord, to help me. May all who want to take my life 
be put to shame and confusion. May all who desire my ruin be turned back to disgrace. May those who say to me, aha, aha, be appalled at their own shame. But may all who seek you rejoice and be glad in you. May those who long for your saving help always say, the Lord is great. But as for me, I am poor and needy. May the Lord think of me. You are my help and my deliverer. You are my God. Do not delay. I meant to say, after that I give it back to Paul, but I forgot to. <laughs>